Hi everyone. Welcome to La Mama Online Happenings. My name is Matt Nasser. I'm the director of the Experiments Play Reading Series. I wanted to talk a little bit about our program before we get started. Uh, we're in our 21st season and uh, basically the program every month we pick a playwright uh, and a work in progress by that playwright and we give it a reading in the hopes to uh, bring it to a, the, a next, the next level to a fully realized production. Uh, during this season, during our pandemic season, we've been experimenting with experiments and we've done different mediums of um, writing to experimental film and uh, basic Zoom readings of traditional plays and tonight we're experimenting again um, with a very special deal, dear to my heart artist, Lauren John Joseph. Uh, they'll be reading an excerpt of a forthcoming novel. Uh, so this is a little different uh, for our experiments. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for everyone that's watching. I hope everyone's healthy and staying safe. Uh, and if you like what we're doing here, and experiments at La Mama in general, please uh, feel free to donate. It's on our website that you're hopefully where you're streaming this. Um, and um, thank you. So without further ado, I'd like to bring on Lauren John Joseph to talk a little bit about the, hello. Good evening, America. <laughs> Good evening. How's it going in London? It's gone just fine. <laughs> you just so got... happy to still be alive. Yeah, you just got out of lockdown in London, and the UK has the vaccine now. Yes, we're the world leaders. Thank you very much. We don't even need the EU. Mm. Oh God, horrible. So um, uh, this excerpt is from an, a forthcoming novel that you're. Um, that's going to be out in next spring, which is in 2022, if we can imagine. Yes, spring 2022. Wow. So that's, it's kind of the same big period as a play, you know, the pl plays that take years to develop till they get a Broadway or off-Broadway um, opening and the no novels, you've, you've sort of worked in almost every medium I can think of. Novels are similar in, in that just to yeah. yeah yeah I'd say that novels take a little bit longer my work in theatre has largely been the equivalent of off Broadway or off West End and they come about a little bit quicker usually inside a year um, but this novel I've been writing for two and a half years so by the time it's published it will be I don't know three and a half something like that um, but publishing is quite slow as I'm realizing interesting and so tell us, I guess, let's um, get back. Let's just go right into it, right? And um, maybe mm, okay. the, the piece and, 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 and read. Right, you are. Okay, then. Um, thanks for being here, everybody. Um, this uh, novel is called At Certain Points We Touch. Um, I'm trying to think what I need to tell you about it for you to understand this extract. It's basically a love story between two people who are very ill-suited, but somehow magnetically attracted. I'm sure that you've all been there. Um, the, the love story, the central love story comes to quite a tragic end when one of the lovers dies unexpectedly. And so the whole book is actually narrated by a protagonist in the present moment in the first person and the protagonist is looking back on the relationship to try and make sense of it. The story moves between the US and the UK and for the extract I'm about to read you need to know that the protagonist has left London for about two or three years but the lover has remained in London and at this point the protagonist is going back to the London back to London for the first time in two or three years and yeah they're traveling back to London trepidatious they're, they actually go back to London via Dublin 
they could have just flown direct, I suppose, but Lord knows I love a narrative detour. Um, the book is full of detours and misadventures and people getting lost, actually. Um, and I feel like I've gone all around the houses writing it. You know, I feel like I've been writing it since the end of the 19th century. And I'm so glad to have finally got it all down on paper. So yes, protagonist traveling back to London via Dublin with their friend, Johnny. And Johnny is an opera singer. So here we go. Recently, I dreamt of you. It's hardly a surprise that since you're at the forefront of my consciousness during all my waking hours, that you'd take a nocturnal detour and wander through the moonlit passages of my sleep. Or perhaps it was more of a hallucination, since I had the feeling that you were absolutely there. Stood at the foot of my bed, you were saying, you're Miss Ramsgate, aren't you? It was as if you'd solved the long-standing riddle, gleefully cracked a code, finally figured out my true identity, something I have certainly never achieved. I wanted to argue my case with you, but I felt bound by a delicacy, a diplomacy. I was aware that you had died and I didn't want to cause you any further upset. Just as when you tell a lover you found someone new, the sight of their pain bestows on you a super sensitive tact, which makes you act far more kindly to them in your final moments together than in many of the preceding years. I think I was also aware of not wanting to make you angry, in part because I've seen enough horror movies to know that enraging the undead is always mighty foolish, but also because of my own fear of my temper, unstoppable once the fuse is lit. So when you said, you're Miss Ramsgate, aren't you? I simply smiled meekly and pieced together the vague and blameless report. I think we've taken different things from this story. I woke from this dream into the strangest of worlds, one in which the emperor of Japan had abdicated and Notre Dame was on fire and tweets demanding the immediate reform of US gun laws kept on coming from my friend Hattie, even though she had been dead since January. The last time I saw her, she was dressed as a naughty nun, smoking an illicit fag outside Rapture Cafe on the Lower East Side, pure Irish-American charm, smiling coyly and wishing Johnny and I a safe flight to Dublin. After leaving New York, I stayed in Ireland for a week, strolling aimlessly and alone, while Johnny did press interviews and charmed the opera festival directors. I spent my time staggering from church to church in a jet-lagged few, weeping with separation anxiety, separate, saturated by the foggy chill I felt on this side of the Atlantic. I can remember kneeling and praying in a pew, in an otherwise desolate nave, remaining there all afternoon, subbing interminably until the cleaning ladies came in. They were surprised to see me there, and I heard them talk in low voices about whether or not they should ease me out so they could shut up shop. The hoss discussion built in whispered intensity, coming to a terse conclusion when one of the unseen guardians hissed, Oh, leave her be, Mary. She's obviously having a hard time. With that, they trundled off to the vestry with the hot buckets, leaving me undisturbed a little while longer. Later that evening, I saw a group of people watching a pair of muscular acrobats climbing up and over each other in the street. They were wearing Union Jack underwear and bowler hats. I stopped briefly, if only to feel myself part of a crowd, and heard the old lady in front of me say to another, Oh, would you come on now, Mary? When you've seen one, you've seen them all. I left the small scrum of onlookers, feeling much the same sentiment, and wondering if every woman in Dublin over the age of 50 was called Mary. I found that a soothing thought. It made me giggle even made me think of the habit Billy and I had of calling each other Mary, in homage to the archetypal old queen whom we adored and channeled, and whom we imagined would always call everyone Mary. Johnny was staying in Dublin until the end of the month to finish his run of shows, but I had no real reason to be there. I was only delaying the inevitable. I was in limbo, between the lost paradise of New York and the awaiting hellfire of London. Plus, it seemed to be inexplicably expensive there. 
some starry-eyed kid who was fawning over Johnny, explained it to us in a bar. Sure, the city hasn't been the same since the boom. The Celtic Tiger was off the chain for a while there, and didn't the prices show it? Then he went in for the kill, as if this well-worn tale of economic disparity had pushed him over the edge of desire. Drunkenly, he poured himself into Johnny's lap, seizing him by the lapels of his jacket and prompting me to make my excuses and leave. Half cut, cold and worn out, walking back to Johnny's festival flat, I decided to linger no longer, to throw myself into the future, which was also my past. When I got in, I used very nearly all the money I had left in the world to book my travel onwards to London. Then I wrote to you. You replied briefly, promptly. You were a little crude. You wrote, okay, Bibbs, a week in my room comes at a cost yet to be established, but you need to do better to please. See you in a bit, kiss. I flew on a tiny plane two days later. It hardly even seemed like a commercial aircraft, more like something for real estate reconnaissance or for ferrying backbench MPs to party political conferences. We landed in Blackpool, in sight of that most British of mockeries, the Blackpool Tower, that ungainly musical star in Parisian drag who seems forever to be saying, no love, we don't need no Europe here. I took the train straight on to London, arriving after dark, half out of my mind with fatigue and culture shock. Nothing had changed. Euston was still the squalid, teeming horror of Burger King wrappers, pigeons, and furious travel delays. The underground was still overcrowded, overlit, and festooned with free newspapers, abandoned, half read. Old Street Station, where I emerged with my suitcase, was still a piss reeking rabbit warren, spewing out travelers from the many grimy exits, studded with hopeless junkies and beggars. It struck me how little I had missed the city, and concomitantly, that I had already set about romanticizing the superior filth of New York. We had arranged to meet at an old haunt. Since you were finishing a job late, and as it was something of a crossroads between the studio and your apartment, we chose the joiner's arms as the X to mark the spot. I lugged my luggage up Hackney Road, cursing the weight every three steps. A cold sweat trickling down my back, the September air crisp. I was worried that I'd have kept you waiting for too long, that you might have already left, cycled off in a blue huff. As it transpired, I arrived before you, stumbling into the largely empty bar, luggage in tow. One of the bar staff immediately started shrieking, you can't bring that in here, as if I dragged my suitcase into St. Paul's, rather than this decrepit gay bar with its puke-stained carpet. The joiners was the same as ever too. The landlady, Beverly, ever regal, came out from behind the bar and contradicted her barman. It's all right, love, she said. You're fine with it. She dismissed the disgruntled employee with a wave, smiled to me and said, been a while, hasn't it, dear? Yes, Bev, I exhaled. It really has. And in you strolled like a cowboy too skinny for his own movie, swaggering over the sticky floor, nothing but undulating limbs all held together by a smirk. My heart ran straight to my mouth. I swear it took every shred of my remaining will to prevent it from bursting right out of my maw and across the room in a geyser of hot blood. With that blase Pacific entrance, the whole interstitial period, two years and six months, fell away for a moment. You were wearing a pair of Exeter University rugby football club shorts, which really were short, shorter than your boxer shorts, which peaked from beneath them, five or six centimeters further down your leg. There was something aristocratic about that, something of the 18th century lace ruff erupting from a sleek embroidered frock coat, like the foam on the head of a wave. Effortless, insouciant, elegant, and of course, adjusting your junk. You gave me that nod and there it was. All right, Bibby. I put my arms around you. You were damp from the cycle and you smelled a little like cradle cap. We sat down at a table just off from the dance floor, the three of us, 
you, me, and the suitcase. You eyed it up and asked, what's all this? My stuff, I said, wondering if I hadn't made the situation clear enough. I'm back, I'm looking for a place. I see, I see, you said, furrowing your brow in mock contemplation. Bibby needs a place, eh? Uh-huh, I replied, flavoring my response with an undertone of, you know that. Hmm, you said with the same facetious expression. Bibby's back in town. I felt pressed at being toyed with so soon. I tried to put my cards in order. I did tell you that I needed somewhere to stay for a bit. Bringing your face right into mine, you nodded lazily. Oh yeah? So when are you going to shave my arsehole then? I hadn't heard that word for such a long time. It zipped through me like a hit of poppers. The Americanized asshole is so ubiquitous and inoffensive. It doesn't carry any of the original words, puerile eroticism. So when you uttered it, I was hit full force with its thrilling jolge and vulgarity and disarmed to the point that I blushed and snorted like a schoolgirl flush with half a bottle of Nana's sherry. Whenever, any time you like, really, was all I could manage by way of response. We talked some more, mainly about your strangely esoteric job in that famous photographer's studio, where you were charged with both utterly anodyne tasks, such as photocopying broadsheet reviews, and missions of real responsibility, like being sent off to Brazil to lay the foundations for a whole new body of work. You were quite careful to mystify it more than was probably necessary. But I couldn't work out if you were just trying to exaggerate your own importance or play it down. You didn't ask me much about my time in New York. You just made a few crass remarks to the tune of that you've been handling a lot of big black cock, haven't you, Bibby? I rolled my eyes. I declined to dignify your provocations. A few pints in, the night wore on, and the bar began to fill slightly. The same pick and mix as always. Casual alcoholics, PhD students no closer to their doctorates, shy kids on first dates, emotional drunks, and screaming queens spilling out of cabs and into the exact same scene as last night. Amongst them was a suave, middle-aged man whom I recognized perhaps from Brooklyn, perhaps from Bethnal Green. The sort of man who seems to have been 45 for the past decade, always wearing a pale blue shirt with the sleeves rolled up, unbuttoned to the sternum, looking like he might direct a show on French television or be readying himself to acquire a tech startup. It's you, he exclaimed, throwing his arms out wide. It is, I said, rising awkwardly to accept his embrace. With his utter lack of self-awareness, he seemed like a peer of the realm, and he dropped down onto the stool next to me, ignoring and immediately enraging you. Hoping to draw his name out subtly, I gestured to you and said, this is my friend, Thomas James. Is it? He replied, barely looking at you. Instead, he took hold of both of my hands, folding them into his lap as he regaled me with sighs of how he'd been hoping to run into me again. It was not how I imagined the evening would progress. I could feel waves of antagonism radiating from you. I tried to turn in your direction, but I was held entirely in place by this not unhandsome interloper until he stood up and offered to get me a drink. Yes, sure, great, thanks. I rattled off a series of agreements to encourage him on his way to the bar. When I turned to face you, you gave me a look of the most deathly stare. I thought you were gonna tell me to fuck off and find somewhere else to sleep. I knew you were capable of that. And I was afraid of what the consequences of my unwilling extramarital flirtations would be. But in fact, when you spoke, you were almost mournful. And you said in a low voice, I don't like him touching you. What was this? Jealousy? Possessiveness? A flash of some true silver feeling on a riverbed perpetually concealed by the muddy waters of your swift flowing self-presentation. I sat up a little more erect and allowed myself to luxuriate for just a moment in the feeling of power your unwitting admission had given me. When my friend returned, 
with a drink for me and one for himself. I could have let a haughty little laugh fly, but I knew that would have been cruel. So I kept it for myself, like a jewel. But I reveled all the same in the sensation of being sat between the two of you, knowing that it was entirely possible that you'd come to blows over me if I were to nudge things in that direction. Out of boredom, I suppose, or the sting of being slighted, you sank into yourself and looked gloomily about the place, your eyes resting first on the pool table, then on the bar, and then on a lonely looking boy who was doing his best to appear not lost. Wickedly perspicacious, my gentleman caller poked me and said, oh, it seems like your friend likes the look of that one over there. He sniggered, and to your pink-faced horror, waved to the boy, beckoning him over like a waiter. I had to admit, it was a very clever plan, palming you off on some clueless undergraduate in order to clear the way. Now that was pleasingly devious. If I'd have had a lace fan about my person, I would have brought it out simply to underline my delight at all of this double dealing. This poor puppy faced boy blushed all the way across the dance floor, shuffling over the gruesome carpet with such timidity. I had to wonder if he'd ever spoken to a person in his whole life. My would-be suitor said aloud, quite brusquely, our friend here thinks you're quite fit, don't you dear? He wants to buy you a drink. You whipped your head around with speech and rage and growled, fuck off. With a vitriol, no one could have read as playful or shy. The scowl on your face, the way you spat out the words, your whole body flexed in tension, ready to rise up and knock him sprawling across the carpet, making such a tinderbox of the whole situation. And this crestfallen, scarlet-faced boy, blinking at the bewildering scene, staring slack-jawed, like he didn't know if he was about to cry or cream his pants. Let's go, you said, drawing yourself up to your full height. I followed you out the door without looking back. We walked home under a moon brilliantly luminous and fully visible from Earth. Her light was startling, perhaps providing that flicker of lunacy with which the evening had been irradiated. In her nearness and her nakedness, truly she seemed like a crazed woman seeking everywhere for lovers. But to what end I could not say, to fuck or dispatch. As we walked, you catalogued aloud all of the slights you had suffered since I'd been gone. The people who had disrespected you, overlooked you for jobs, snubbed you socially, and how you would pay them back tenfold as soon as you had the chance. You lived on perpetually thinning ice, but instead of treading carefully, moving slowly, you were forever thundering down on the verglas hard as hell. Your fury shaved a full five minutes off the journey, in spite of my heavy suitcase and your always unwieldy bicycle. Though by the time we arrived at your apartment, it was approaching midnight. In the stillness of the night, the old fateful fluorescent still buzzed too loudly as you flicked them on. It was all as I had pictured it. Those hundreds of times over since we'd last seen each other. On that evening we'd spent watching your VHS tapes and losing our youthful illusions. The place was the same disarray of junky paraphernalia and kitsch of genuine value, all displayed without design. The tap of the kitchen sink still dripped with certainty into the gray plastic washing up bowl, and the turquoise linoleum still longed for repair or replacement. Perhaps you had new roommates sleeping in their secret chambers behind the plywood walls, but I had never really known your old roommates, so such a change was negligible if it registered at all. The only thing that had changed in all the time that suddenly filled the void between then and now was your bedroom doorway. I had only ever known there to be a rudimentary plank, haphazardly used to seal up your room when it was time to sleep or fuck. But now there was a door, an actual door, hung on hinges, standing ajar now, yes, but its very openness suggesting that such a situation might not always be the case. It hinted that some things may have changed after all. A little shudder ran through me. And when I looked into your room, it was like looking into an open grave. I stepped in, kicking a few of the t-shirts on the floor to clear a path. A scent, a cologne I recognized, lingered in there, not yours. You didn't wear any. 
it out to me that I couldn't figure out where I knew this fragrance from because I have a keen memory for these things. But then perhaps it was only the scent of the past. I ran my fingers over a large format black and white photocopy of two teenage boys mid fight. And I toyed with the dusty collection of plastic figurines on top of your chest of drawers. You moved past me, sat down on your bed and opened your laptop, slipping your right hand into your underwear and chewing the nails of your left, as if unaware I was there at all. I'm going to brush my teeth, I said. All right, you said, paying no attention. In the bathroom, I casually rifled through the collection of cosmetics inside the mirrored cabinet above the sink. It was an incongruous assortment of cheap supermarket products and toiletries from the gentleman's perfumers of German Street. Expensive floral shaving soap from Trumpers and grimy plastic bottles of Nivea aftershave balm. There are at least seven toothbrushes in various stages of decay. A few disposable razor blades lying on the shelves, glinting like dead flies on their back and a beautiful blue plastic comb, far too handsome to have been made this side of the 1970s. I perused this autobiography and beauty product whilst I brushed my teeth, closing the cupboard when I was done and moving on to stare at myself in the dirty mirrored door. I remembered one of Johnny's stories about he had watched himself weep in a mirror street with toothpaste and spit after hearing of the death of his favorite aunt. Such a tender tale, I sighed. Had he told me this in Dublin? Or was it just an anecdote from his show? I couldn't be sure. My head was foggy, my eyes slightly bloodshot, my complexion a little sallow. I was tired and wishing for not much more than a good night's sleep. I could have called up right there in the bathroom. I had stashed my suitcase in the living room but my attempts to tuck it away neatly behind the furniture had only served to make it look more intrusive, more cumbersome. I passed by the tattered old case, lying there friendless behind the sofa, and shook my head in silent pity, acknowledging it both as an accident waiting to happen and as a situation far beyond my control. Resigned, I re-entered your room. And there you were, sat on the end of your bed, lit only by the desk lamp. You were barefoot in a t-shirt. Your rugby shorts had been discarded to the floor and your cock was hard, tenting your striped boxes. So Bibby's back in town, eh? You said, quietly, almost to yourself. I stepped towards you, kissed you, and you fell backwards like a corpse onto the bed, pulling me down with you. The inevitability of it all. At once we fragmented, flying out into a shower of limbs, our component parts scattered in all directions by the propulsive forces of desire, only for our outlines to contract around us again sharply, resembling us in the demi-darkness, reassembling us as an erratic pattern of touches, gasps and fumbles, our torsos scorching against each other, teeth colliding, erections smashing. Sex made us a cubist masterpiece, flattened and dislocated, seen with new eyes yet still so familiar, sprawling in all directions at once, a spasming freeze of warfare and pleasure. I raised your head up off the pillow, clasping my hands behind your dirty blonde skull, like Salome kissing the head of John the Baptist. I put from my mind the pain and the distress, which came as the direct result of our last encounter. I wished to be washed clean in this renewed intimacy, this new River Jordan. I wanted you to tell me it was all better now, but of course you never did. That's that. Thank you. My pleasure. That was wonderful. Thank I'm you. I'm excited to read the whole thing. I live as long till 2020. <laughs> well, I'll send you a PDF, babes. Oh, thank you. Thanks. The perks of being a <laughs> director. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so when did the, this, this is your journey. You, you had been in New York for how long? You'd made New York your home for a while before this relationship. You had this relationship and you were in San Francisco, New York. You, 
tell us a little bit about when mm -hmm. okay yeah well the the book is definitely a work of uh auto fiction or meta fiction as i used to call it um and it's um emotionally true if not um factually true so yeah, there are a lot of um similarities between my life and what happens in the book um i did have a very complicated relationship with someone in the time that i was living between america and the uk yes that's true and i did live in new york for quite a time and you <laughs> you um you commented that you had nostalgia for it um as time has gone by do you still have nostalgia for new york yeah i mean of course anybody who's living in 2020 can't have no can't but have nostalgia for 10 years ago i think yeah. um but but that line in there when the when the protagonist gets back to london and is immediately um feeling nostalgic for new york i guess i'm very interested in the book with thinking about how we create memories and create narratives of the past um and that can happen instantaneously you know what i mean you can have a rose tinted view on yesterday although yesterday was absolutely horrible you know what i mean but i most definitely have a soft spot for new york and also berlin and also san francisco all the places i lived really they were i lived in those places in times of my life that were absolutely crucial to my personal development uh so speaking of the development of that so 10 years ago to now uh, obviously, every you know, people grow, they mature, they get to know themselves better. What is it like writing uh, about yourself in the first person from ten years ago with what you know? Is it almost like it's not you at all? Is it and and I, specifically for you, your journey in gender identity and you know, I can imagine most novel novelists writing about their past uh, as you know keep having a, a, a you know i am a man i was a man then i'm i'm a man now uh there's another layer there of change mm -hmm. and growth yeah and I'm interested to uh hear what you have to say about that um so when i look back i definitely what's been very interesting is that i recognize myself because when you're writing from this point in time, there's a lot of resources, you know, a lot of the pictures from these times and messages are online. I can like dig back in Facebook and things like this and emails. So I, I can have a pretty good idea of who I was then. But what's been interesting is that in thinking about it and writing about it, I remembered things that I'd entirely forgotten. So I'd actually have a different understanding of who I was then because you know you create these stories about yourself and where you've been and who you are and then when you think deep about things you remember whole new details which cast everything in a different light um so i do feel like the same person i was then i just have come into a different sort of focus i suppose um and in terms of my own gender journey I mean, I think my gender has always been very expensive and nebulous. And I mean, 10 years ago, I think what's changed is the language around identity now. 10 years ago, I mean, I was telling people I was transdrogenous, you know what I mean? We didn't have, we didn't have non-binary in my day, um, <laughs> you know. So I said, I mean, you had to make up your own language and sadly, transdrogenous didn't stick, um, <laughs> but now we've got non-binary. Um, so yeah, I always, I mean, you remember like 10 years ago, you'd see me at a party in a green velvet cocktail dress or, you know, whatever mad thing. Um, I, so yeah, I feel like my gender is always evolving, always in a state of flux. And maybe, I don't know, language is catching up to that. Although not if you read Suzanne Moore's articles, it's not. Yes, I, yeah. I, I that's a great point. I, I you know, I, it has been, since I've been lucky to know you that long, it really- Very lucky, Matthew, very lucky. <laughs> and, you know, uh, yeah, we're, we're catching up, we're catching up. <laughs> I, I think uh, specifically for 
the end of this piece and I was thinking about um, it seems like the character, you know, it, it is in a sticky situation. They're, they've, they are moving back to London. They don't know where they're, what the future holds. It's a very vulnerable time. What, I mean, I guess the question is, did you feel at all, or do you feel in this scene of uh, this ex-lover letting you stay there uh, in, in some ways, taking advantage of that situation? Was that uh, a part of um, the dynamic going on there? Uh, does that- It certainly came to pass like that, actually, yes. I mean, the, the, the relationship on which this relationship is built was a, you know, it was an intimate, romantic, erotic, sexual relationship. So um, in, in that regard, um, though I didn't feel like I was being taken advantage of, but that was, as the situation became more complicated, and I go into that in some depth in the book, um, it did become, I guess, weaponized against me in, in a way um, where this ex-lover, um, yeah, sort of pressured me in a way to be like, well, you're staying with me, so got to make it worth my time. And there was something flirtatious about it, but then ultimately there was actually something sort of intimidating because when I moved back to London, I had really nothing. I think I came back to London with like a hundred pounds or something. Um, and I didn't have a place to live. And I was also just very naive. You know what I mean? I thought it'll be fine. I'll get a student loan. I'll, you know, things will come together. I'd never taken any responsibility for myself. I just sort of pinged around the world, just like, oh yeah, my friend says, move to New York. Oh yeah, my friend says, you know, let's run a hotel in San Francisco. And I just did all of these things. And now when I look back, I think, how did you survive any of these like lunatic adventures? Um, so yeah, in short, it did, I, that situation did become unpleasant, unfortunately. Because I, I thought, as it always is liable to do when there's any kind of power imbalance, if that's economic or, you know, any, any other power imbalance, someone can take advantage of that. If they are not, you know, not always a wonderful person and this um, ex-lover was not always a wonderful person. And the book is very much in dialogue with that, with remembering somebody who is a very problematic, complicated person and looking back on that person and feeling that you loved them and that you missed them, but also they could be quite terrible at times. Wonderful. I look forward to reading the entire PDF manuscript. Um, well, I'm, I'm going to have a lot of questions for you, Matthew. So. Okay. I'm, I'm, Pay attention. I'll be ready. I'll be ready. Thank you so much again. Thanks for everybody My pleasure. watching. Um, sign up on our mailing list. Is there anything else that you want to? I don't know. From you know, I oh, I wanted to talk about your scarves. People can get these scarves. What are the scarves? Oh yes, yes, I am. I am selling scarves. Yeah, um, they're football scarves, and they say "Big Madam Energy," and they're from a series called Hacked Knits Scarves for Gallerists. Last year, I was selling one which said, um all art is gay and that was very popular um it was designed in the liverpool football club logo and it actually caused a lot of fights um because people thought it was a real liverpool football club scarf and it wasn't um this one looks like this um it's pink on pink it's got a lovely crystal ball oh, and it says big madam energy and it's inspired by you know nancy pelosi and all those gals um and they're being sold and all the proceeds are going to Black Lives Matter UK. Um, you know, because artists have to stand in solidarity with people of color, especially in this time of ongoing austerity and, uh, you know, political division and oppression. So BLM baby. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Lauren and John Joseph. I, I'm so blessed to know you. I'm so blessed to work at La Mama where we get to work with artists all around the world. And uh, 
well, I, you know, I didn't get to say this, but I, we've been dying to have you come here for so long yes. uh, to work. So at least we get to do this virtually and after everyone's vaccinated, herd immunity, <laughs> hopefully we'll get to see you here in person. You can count on it. Wonderful. Thank you again. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Goodbye.